Welcome to This Week in Medicine brought to you by the Foxhall Foundation, November 1st, 2021. We're going to do this briefly today. You're benefiting from Halloween yesterday, and I didn't spend a lot of time making this talk this week, to be honest. Um, again, these talks are brought to you by the Foxhall Foundation, which is our 501c3, uh, and our uh, motto is aging well. So we added nutrition. If you want to arrange a nutrition consultation through the Foxhall Foundation, in balance nutrition, PLLC at gmail.com. Uh, send an email. Carrie is our nutritionist and she is doing an outstanding job. She's just getting started. Uh, we also have a wellness center, which we are still working on getting off the ground as we leave some of our COVID um, restrictions. We have Tala doing yoga, and we have key adult classes in movement and balance. Those are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 12 to 1. So check out our website. Uh, check out Kenzendo Karate. We have classes for children and adults throughout the age spectrum. Again, our classes are Monday and Friday. We're working on adding some more classes for yoga and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the key uh, active movement classes. So what stressed out the inbox this week in our office? Well, there are definitely questions about air travel safety uh, because everybody's planning on moving around for Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we've been thinking about that and how we're going to do that safely. Uh, again, the winter holidays, part of air travel safety, the J&J &J second shot. I think people are doing very well with this. Um, my patients have been able to get the Pfizer or the Moderna booster. One patient, unfortunately, um, was in a bit of an argument with her pharmacist about which shot she should get. If you had a J&J &J first shot, you're supposed to get a 100% Moderna booster or a 100% Pfizer booster, not the 50%. Um, so I think the pharmacists are doing their best, but sometimes they don't have these um, minor differences. But if you're a patient who got a J&J &J shot, major difference in the strength of the Moderna booster. It's 50% for people who already had two Moderna shots, but 100% if you had a J&J. &J. Um, so this may still be a little difficult. How to interact with the unvaccinated. Again, we're very lucky in our area that we do not have many unvaccinated people. I would say uh, interacting with the unvaccinated is a full protective mask. Yes, you are vaccinated. Yes, you may even have your booster shot, but it's still a scary proposition. Vaccine for kids is coming along. We heard uh, this past week that even though the emergency use authorization for Moderna has been submitted to FDA, they are going to take their time on this one for the teenage category. So um, it's probably Pfizer booster for a while, which should be available soon, but Moderna will probably take a while for the kids. Uh, don't forget your vaccine card. It is uh, very helpful to have it. And Halloween was a respite from all the stress. And actually, I thought it went really well and had a great time yesterday on Halloween giving out candy. And it was quite a safe experience and very pleasant. So again, the booster recommendations really quickly because I know this gets boring. Uh, the J&J first shot is um, Moderna or a Pfizer if it's Moderna. Uh, it's 100% Moderna, not 50% uh, if you got the J&J &J shot or a Pfizer 100%. 100% was tested in this NIH study that people keep talking about. No one was tested with a 50% Moderna booster for if you were a J&J &J shot patient. Uh, Moderna, if you got two first shots that were obviously 100% potency, you'll get a 50% Moderna booster. And Pfizer is 100% all the way through. And yes, I've had patients mix and match. So a patient today just told me they had uh, two Moderna shots, but they got a Pfizer booster because the pharmacy didn't have the booster shot for Moderna. So it's okay to mix and match. Special considerations. Again, if you're a woman who got a J&J &J shot, you may want to get another J&J &J shot. Um, again, you can uh, mix and match these, that's fine, but watch out for menstrual regularity. We've seen a lot of this year, that this year. Mostly it's with heavy menstrual periods as a result of getting an mRNA vaccine. It's not permanent. Most people's uh, cycles are uh, sort of resetting themselves, but I think it was notable by the gynecologist and certainly by myself uh, with patients in the office. Also, if you're a young man who got the J&J, &J, consider staying with the J&J, &J, although honestly, this myocarditis risk, especially as we're looking at kids, is not very um, significant, and the illness with myocarditis from a vaccination is a lot less serious than myocarditis from actual COVID disease. 
Uh, everyone should get vaccinated if you're over 18 and you only got one J&J &J vaccine, so definitely get another shot. Uh, if you're greater than 65 years old, doesn't matter which vaccine you got, you probably did get an mRNA vaccine, get a booster. There is more convincing data this week from Israel that immunity with two shots wanes and decreases, but they do already have some data from Israel that's quite strong that the immunity from the third shot is very good and is lasting. Um, again, you can get a vaccine, but it's not mandatory. And I've talked about this with a lot of patients this week for their physical. You don't have to get a booster. Uh, you can also time it if you wanna wait until December, January, February. As COVID rates go down, especially regionally, in our region, the COVID rates are way down under 100 per 100,000 for seven day average. As those numbers keep going down, People are wondering, should they really get a third dose, especially if they're in a low risk group? And I think that's worth considering not getting a booster. So booster confusion, Pfizer, yes, get a booster. J&J, &J, definitely one shot is protective, but not fully protective. Moderna, yes, but if you had uh, Pfizer or Moderna for your first two shots, it's gonna be a 50%. Uh, soon kids will be able to get the Pfizer, but probably not the Moderna because that is going to take extra time at FDA for review. And I believe tomorrow is the CDC meeting. So November 2nd, CDC is going to meet to talk about these Pfizer kids boosters. All right, so this is Diabetes Awareness Month. We are out of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It is November 1st. So the focus of the National Diabetes uh, Month, November of 2021, is prediabetes and preventing diabetes, which makes sense because we can do this. Um, this is something, if you are my patient, we've been doing in the office quite a bit. According to the CDC, more than one in three U.S. adults have prediabetes. So that's 88 million people. What is prediabetes? How do we define that? Well, if you're my patient, again, we're probably defining that as a blood test called the hemoglobin A1C. We might be triggered to do that blood test by your fasting blood sugar, but I find fasting blood sugar is very inaccurate to di diagnose people as prediabetic. It's much better to use the hemoglobin A1C. Some patients will get so excited when they get a blood test that their blood sugar shoots right up. Some people just had a cup of coffee, so their adrenaline might be up from the coffee. So a fasting blood sugar is just your blood sugar at that moment in time. And although research studies indicate that fasting blood sugar is a way to detect prediabetes, it's probably not as good as the hemoglobin A1C. And the hemoglobin A1C is vastly easier to do than an oral glucose tolerance test. Women who've been pregnant know about the oral gl glucose tolerance test. You have to drink a glucose solution and then check your blood test at half an hour and hour intervals. It can take a whole morning to do that test. Uh, doing a hemoglobin A1C is much easier. We just do it with your blood draw. So if you get a report from me, and some of you have been getting your reports sent to you by email or we, I can show you in person, this is the hemoglobin A1C number, 6.6. .6. The reference range is less than 5.7. Why? Because less than 5.7 is consistent with the absence of diabetes. That means your blood sugar most of the time is quite good. But if you're in a 5.7 to 6.4 range, that's where we say you have prediabetes. Meaning that if this number stays in this range for years, and every year we check it, it's in a 5.7 to 6.4 range, you are increasing your risk of eventually getting full-blown diabetes. What's full-blown diabetes? A hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5. Now, that being said, I have patients who have a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5. I tell them, you now look like you're getting diabetes. Can you turn the clock back? Yes, you absolutely can. Just because you have a one-time test that's elevated doesn't mean that you permanently have diabetes. We can turn it back. There are a lot of things that we can do, diet and exercise, but also medication. So what are your risks for prediabetes? Well, if a third of uh, Americans are at risk for diabetes, then being American is a risk for prediabetes, unfortunately. Um, but we're a big mixing melting pot in this country. So there are a lot of different genetics that are involved in being an American, obviously. So we all bring with us our genetic predisposition and background. Uh, there are certain islands like Palau, like Guam, where the population has a risk of diabetes of one in five. So it can be extremely high in certain communities and countries. Um, family history, we always ask who in your family has adult onset diabetes in particular? Who in your family has insulin-dependent diabetes? Who had diabetes as a teenager? Also, autoimmune disease does correlate with diabetes. 
So if you have a family history of hypothyroidism, autoimmune hypothyroid disease, which is extremely common, or other autoimmune diseases, your risk will go up for diabetes. Gestational diabetes, um, it's very important to tell your doctor to tell me if you've had blood sugar elevation during pregnancy because that's a very strong predictor for diabetes as an adult. Nicotine substitutes. Thank you, Walter. This was from my patient who told me uh, that nicotine substitutes can increase your risk for uh, abnormal blood sugar metabolism. He was a very astute and intelligent intelligent patient who did this research. Um, if you suck 20, 30, commit lozenges in a day or use a lot of nicotine gum, that constant assault on your body with the nicotine can increase your blood sugar. Of course, diet sources are, are a cause for prediabetes. I had one patient who told me he was healthy, he turned over a new leaf because he was drinking naked juices. If you take a look at the bottle of naked juice, I think it's maybe 30 to 50% apple juice. So he was very happy with himself because he was drinking his fruits and he thought this was healthy for him, but it really wasn't because it's concentrated sugar. So I think a lot of us know now that even though these juices look like they're healthy, um, look at the label first to make sure it's not mostly consisting of sugar and apple juice. Another patient that I had had prediabetes, and this was probably 10 or 15 years ago. And we discovered in her, it was because she was eating so much dried fruit. And the dried fruit she was eating were apple slices, prunes, which are really concentrated fruit sugar. So once she cut that out of her diet, this was probably 15 years ago, she has not had a problem with her sugar since. She did a great job reducing her concentrated sugar dry fruit. Finally, one other source that's very good and is a good uh, fruit source for sugar are berries. Berries do not have the concentrated sugar that bananas and apples, apricots and prunes do. Berries are low glycemic, so go ahead and eat your berries. Um, they're a very good part of your diet and of course they have antioxidants and they're not a substantial source for uh, sugar from fruit. So these are probably your safest fruits to eat. And then of course, I think we know the usual dietary sources, refined sugar, um, processed food, processed cakes, uh, and donuts and hard candies. That's kind of obvious, but look for the hidden sugars in your diet. And if you need help looking for those hidden sugars, feel free to arrange an appointment with our nutritionist. Of course, we all know that being inactive and sedentary reduces your ability to burn calories. Uh, medications like prednisone will inc increase your blood sugar. There are other medications that also can increase blood sugar. Uh, other diseases can also increase your risk for diabetes like polycystic ovarian disease, which may occur in one out of five women some endocrinologists speculate that polycystic ovarian disease, which is an insulin resistant syndrome that can lead to infertility, may be one of the most common, what we call endocrinopathies, meaning endocrine diseases. So there are also a lot of medical conditions that can increase your risk for diabetes. So you can see here, there are many different factors. Just explore these when you come in for your physical so you can see which one of these do you tick off on your list so that you know what's increasing your risk. This is a great uh, video schematic. Uh, hopefully it will start. It discusses how we determine our risk with the hemoglobin A1C. Um, I borrowed this from the internet. It's a great video. Uh, it shows what the heme molecule looks like, hemoglobin, oxygen molecules. So these are the globin or protein parts of your hemoglobin molecule. These are the heme parts, that's why they're red. So this is what the molecule looks like that we are measuring. There are the heme parts, there are the oxygen molecules. It keeps spinning. And then oxygen attaches to these iron fragments that are part of the heme. And then eventually, that's the iron of the heme molecule. Um, the molecule is going to attract sugar. So the sugar is in blue. Sugar molecules will start coating the hemoglobin. The more sugar molecules you have floating around in your bloodstream, the more these sugar molecules will attach to what we are measuring, which is the hemoglobin. So these are all your sugar molecules floating around in your bloodstream and they are attaching, you can see, to this hemoglobin. So we will take a sample of your blood, we will take these molecules out, and we will measure the number of these blue molecules that are attached, which is your sugar. So this was uh, just a demonstration I wanted you to know of how we measure this number. 
If you remember the blue molecules are sugar and they're floating around in your bloodstream, we can count those and we can count them every 60 to 90 days. Every 60 to 90 days, the blood cell dies and we get a new population. And so those blood cells are cleaned out by your spleen. So they take out the blood cells and the sugar molecules and you repopulate from your bone marrow with another supply for 60 to 90 days of those hemoglobin mole molecules and they will pick up the sugar molecules floating in your bloodstream. Obviously, the less sugar molecules you have floating in your bloodstream, the less will adhere to that molecule and your number will be less. Fast pitch, it is Diabetes Awareness Month, as I just said. Uh, get your booster if you got the J&J &J vaccine. If you're over 18, getting the booster definitely helps. Consider a Pfizer or Moderna booster. It's okay to get your flu shot together, uh, but consider the additive side effects because uh, especially the high-dose flu shot associated with, let's say, a Moderna booster could uh, give you significant side effects. Old school versus new school, especially in terms of your blood sugar. We used to say you are what you eat. Obviously, it's more complex than that. New school is our future is the sum of our various risks. And some of our risks are substantial, like genetics. That's not what you eat. That's your genetics. I had a patient who went on an entirely green diet. She had green vegetables for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But her genetics were such that it didn't matter that she had completely eliminated carbohydrates and sugars from her diet. She still was pre-diabetic. So don't beat yourself up. Don't play the blame game. Just deal what you have that you can work with. Uh, a lot of times it's just genetics and we can do something with that. We have enough medication and enough high tech these days that you do not have to become a full blown diabetic. Tony's tip of the week, you don't need to fast for that hemoglobin A1C blood test. Remember the hemoglobin A1C blood test is picking up sugar molecules in your bloodstream, but it's picking them up for 60 to 90 days. So fasting for that blood test will mean you have four hours where you don't have sugar in your bloodstream that's attaching to the hemoglobin molecule, molecule. But really this is a test that measures 60 to 90 days. So you don't have to fast for this test. And that's it.